We're here with John Lombardo at Artists and Models 25, okay. musician. Yeah, hey, hi, Greg. And do I have to clear this with your publicist? Or is no, this okay? No. no. So when you get to do it, when people just, people do this all, all the time, though, the paparazzi and interviewers are always grabbing you on a spur. The origin of the word paparazzi comes from? No. So you don't? I don't know. It's interesting because it's come to mean irritating journalists, right? I don't know. It's from the movie La Dolce Vita by Fellini. It's the first time this heard this bunch of photographers were referred to as the paparazzi. And all it means is swarming insects. Swarming insects, that's in La Dolce Vita? That, but that's what the word means in Italian. And they say it because they're insulting the, uh, the people taking the photos there? They referred to them as paparazzi and that stuck. And now, Makes sense. all these years later, the, the, the famous movie. Yeah. So when we start doing your autobiography, Nobody likes a uh, wanker. We'll start with your childhood. Was that exciting, the childhood? Um, I had a nice childhood, a very nice childhood, really. So, so no, like, traumatic 20, first 20 years. The first 20 years were good. Real good, yeah. And then you got into music. Music changed your life. You never started, you know, when did you start playing guitar? Um, How old were you? I was about 20. I was, so uh, older, yeah. Junior, the, the summer in between my junior and senior years of college. Really. Well, How did you decide to pick it up all of a sudden because you were a little older? I met a lot of musicians and I thought, I'm as smart as they are, I don't know what I'm missing here. So I bought a bass. Figured so anyone can play bass, it's four strings. And I taught myself to play the bass and then I went back to college senior year and I formed a band right away from a little uh, sticker on the, you know, on the Musicians Wanted page. What was that called? Ter embarrassingly, it's called Succotash. Well, that's not that bad. When I would book gigs, we'd call it the Lakeville Rhythm Kings. It's nice. So you played bass in that? Yeah. I always played bass. 10,000 Maniacs was the first group I ever played guitar in. Why did you make the switch? Because we were all kind of amateurs when we started 10,000 Maniacs, and they already and there was a bass player, and I always wanted to play guitar, but only by then was I confident enough to do it. But you also got it. You must have also got into it when you were 20, because you realize, as we all know, that women love musicians, right? That's pretty obvious. When it wasn't strong. just. It wasn't just like you were doing. Love musicians. What's your name, John Lombardo? Uh, get away, kid. Were you with the Eagles? Get away, kid. I was with the Eagles. You were in the Eagles, John? No, Philadelphia Eagles. Oh, you were in the Philadelphia Eagles. You, you were a receiver, right? Yeah. Or number 89, I believe. This happened to you a lot when you were interviewed, right? Where the fans start swarming around you while you're trying to be interviewed. They're he's bugging not you. a fan. He's a ball buster. Oh, he's a friend of yours. Oh, yeah. Richard Did Fitcher. You say when the flies start swarming around you or the fans? Richard Fitcher from 19 Thatcher. It's true. I am Richard Fitcher. Now, I talked to Joe Rosler earlier, your, your partner in some of your musical endeavors. He said that... I said, "How do you? What do you think of the playing with John?" He said, "Well, I can almost remember it. It's almost memorable. How do you feel about that?" He said, "It was almost memorable when he plays with you." He, can, he says, "After he gets on the stage, like you can almost remember it." I don't know. I think you heard it wrong. No, that's what I got. It, I got it recorded. It was a weird. He's a weird dude. It's what you journalists do? No, I rec it's recorded with this obscure quote, maybe out of context, <laughs> make me feel awkward. I'm sorry, John. All right. I don't. I don't mean to make. Who remembers it? I think he was joking. I'm just oh, saying, you know, it's yeah. just a weird. You know how Joe's a weirdo. See again, you're, you know. Is he a weirdo or not? You know, these are propaganda techniques. You oh. know how Joe's a weirdo. So in other words, that's begging the question. You know, Joe is not a weirdo, John. There's no. No, I said he was a weirdo. I know. So I mean, I studied speech communication in college, so I recognize all of these techniques. Now, when we do the autobiography, are you going to get into some real emotion? And are you going to get into some real dirt to make it really exciting for the, for the, for the reader? I'll probably, uh, as we sit there and talk about it, there'll probably be some pretty interesting things that really happen. But then I might have to reflect on whether or not like the person's still alive or the person would be hurt by it. Or I'm not going um, to mention girls in that kind of not that kind of thing. But you can mention girls without names, though, and that way you can say I'll have a lot of interesting girl stories without names. Yeah. Like but Ms. Think, X. But I think it's more music, you know. But. Well, yeah, because you got your music, your musical career of 35 years, and you got the musical, all, all the musicians you met, all the music stories of meeting the Pogues and Joe Strummer and everybody, over and over, meeting people and being on tour with REM, etc. I don't know if these are REM stories, right? Yeah, I have some of those as well. So there, I mean, you were on tour with them. They're a, they're a bunch of weirdos, right? <laughs>
Well, they're all, they're four really different people. I mean, um, they don't even hang out together, you know, when they're not on stage very much. Did you like them? I liked them all, but in, in different ways, because they were quite different. I hung around with Peter uh, Buck mostly. Because he was a guitarist. That's why you wanted to pick up some guitar pointer? No, he was the coolest one, and he also knew a lot about other bands. Like, he was the real music fan in the group that would go to, you know, he knew all the cool after-hours clubs and sort of took me in a little bit, you know. That's groovy. So in the book, well, there's going to be girl stuff, there's going to be your life story, there's going to be music, and will there be sports in the book? Are you going to mention your sports love? Because that's like one of your favorite things is sports. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I can actually prove one thing. I was the last high school football player in Western New York to wear a leather helmet. This is like your like, coach punishing you, right? Just because I was Italian, I think. So, because you have, you're incorrigible. I was a starter, and I had the fuck. I had a leather helmet. You can swear we're on podcast. I had a leather helmet. He and there was two guys that had leather leather helmets. Me and the fattest guy and the and the skinniest guy. And the fat guy only got one because it was the only one that fit him. But we had these new Rockney helmets. So the coach did it because you. The coach did it because you were an incorrigible upstart, right? You were a rebel. Me out of the lineup. Yeah. Why were you rebelling when you were playing a team sport? Why didn't you just? Well, you got to remember, it's 1969, and it was the height of the anti-war movement. And some of us actually, you know, organized demonstrations in school. We lowered the flag to half-mast the day that the Kent St State students were killed. And the football team guys came out and wanted to, like, beat the shit out of us. But I thought that was the right thing to do. You know, they were just college students walking on their campus. Three out of four weren't even anti-war. Well, football itself is very violent. You, is that one of the reasons you love football? Because of the violence? There's tons of violence and a lot of hard hitting. I love football because it's the greatest team sport ever made in terms of, um, it's literally like a battle. You, you kind of plan uh, each play, you know? You go into the huddle, the offense tries to come up with either the, the most logical play for that down and distance, or the most illogical, catch them with their drawers down. You know what I mean? Yeah, but what about third, the... Third and one from your 20, and you throw a bomb, because no one expects it. So there's that element, you know, of... The, the, there's that element of planning and surprise. It's great. So there's nothing else you love as much as sports, music, and women, right? Those are your top three? Uh, sports, music, and women, right? And um, I like to party. You like to party? Have you ever drank alcohol or smoked pot? Yes and yes. And you think that's a good thing to put in your book because the kids are like the kids might read it and get the wrong idea. Well, that's what I've been thinking of, you know, considering. I, but you know, would you recommend it to the young people to go out and drink and, and smoke pot, or should they be sober? Um, I don't Clean know. living. I think you should wait until you're about 17 or 18. Is that what you did? Wait, you were 17 or 18. Yeah. And so once you, once you hit around 18, start drinking and start smoking pot. go home when you're really like drunk and you're in like 8th and ninth grade. Although my parents had a real double standard. They let me do it, but if my sister ever did, the fur would fly. Just because you were male? Yeah. Well, I mean... The Italian double standard, you know? So you, the Italian heritage is important to you? You don't think of yourself as an American, the, the Italian heritage? Oh no, I think of myself as American. I'm saying there was an, there is an Italian double standard. You know, like like in Italy, a lot of men have a, an outside girlfriend, outside of their marriage, for years and years. But if a woman ever did it, they'd fucking kill her, you know? It's not they, right. They would literally kill her. They might. Wow, they are. Cubs would. Right. So, but you're not a male show as pig, are you? Uh, no. No, you like, you like, you're a feminist, correct? A feminist? Yeah, a feminist. Equality for all people. Yeah. And that doesn't, that doesn't stop when the check comes either. No. So when you go on a date, you want to be, go Dutch. Yeah. Women probably pay for you though, because you're, uh, you're... No, even the ones that are rich don't. Why is that? I know women that are making a hundred grand a year, and when the, when the check comes, they look at you like, 
they're like Pollyanna and it's 1963. What a bunch of bullshit. It just happens. I'm not making a total generalization, but equality is equality. It's across the board, you know? Yeah. I think Hillary should be president. She'll be the next president. You want her to be president? Yeah. I kissed her twice. Well, you, you, when you, you met her when you played at the inauguration. You want to play one of the balls for Hill, Hillary and Bill. And then we also played um, at a last minute pep rally for her at Buff State. It was the day. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. Where, um, right. Bill Cause was there. Doug Flutie played drums with us. And that was Rob Buck's last ever it was game. His last gig, yeah. He was, so he was already sick when. Uh, he was very sick. He looked. He had a lot of personality. He must have great stories about him. He was Mr. He was Mr. Comedy. He was always cracking a joke. Yeah. So you have good stories about him. Like, didn't he, didn't he meet Jerry Garcia with the, uh, and Jerry Garcia said, you got better weed than the Grateful Dead does? That's a good story. Yeah. <laughs> and the Pogues, well, meeting the Pogues. What happened there? Uh, you got other people to interview. I don't want to take up all your camera space. Well, just give them Pogue story and I won't finish up. Wasn't it a great Pogue story? Didn't you meet the Pogue? That was a good story. Meet the Pogues. We were checking into a hotel. It was around one in the morning and it was in like, um, in the north of England, I think. Um, I can't remember which city it was. It was in Birmingham. And um, just by chance, they were checking in too. And uh, the, you know, the, the road managers would take care of everyone was hanging there. It was like, we knew it was a Pogues, it was obvious. So Dennis Drew, our keyboard player, struck up a conversation with them. And they were kind of being a little bit standoffish, like, oh, you know, you know, we were saying we like your band. They go, uh, we have a band too. And they go, oh, you've got a band. You don't look like musicians, that kind of thing, you know? And then he goes, hey, he goes, I, I want to meet John. John is the, is the biggest fan of your group. He's the funny one. He's got the jokes, right? And Shane goes, oh, you're the funny one, eh? He goes, got, and you're an American? I go, yeah. He goes, got any jokes about Vietnam? And I was like, you knew he was like, I go, yeah, I do have one. And I said, why did we lose such a disproportionate number of African-American soldiers? And he goes, oh, I don't know. And I said, um, every time someone would yell, get down, they would stand up and dance. And he would start to go, ah! Slap us on the back, invited us, or they invited themselves to our room, because we had the thing full of booze. Yeah. And that's why I learned to drink where you don't have to drink the same thing all night. Oh, you switch, you switch liquid? One thing to another to another. So you don't stick with Wabachi? Yeah. No, well, me, I'll have a red wine and a beer or something, maybe a shot. But they'll, they'll do, they'll drink tequila, then they'll have a white wine, then they'll have a, a, a ale. It's wild. I thought mixing it was bad somehow. Isn't that like it's sort of an urban myth, I think. Oh, so mixing it's good. You should mix it up through the whole evening. I don't think it's neither good nor bad. Oh, it's neutral. It's just, it's just booze. I always you know? thought it was like, somehow that everyone said like, you have whiskey, and then you have beer, and then you have scotch, and then you have vodka, and then you have like some whatever. But that's not true. That's just the urban myth. Well, in the old days of like the Jewish religion, they wouldn't have meat and dairy on the same. Right. I don't know why. I just didn't do it. So this is the kind of thing, John, will be. Uh, we're we'll on a tangent. Yeah, but I mean, it doesn't matter because we're going to transcribe things, and then we're going to, and then we're going to show it to you, and we all, you know. But it's, this is the kind of a dry run for what I'll be doing at your house. So you're gonna let me come over to your house soon and we'll continue this kind of conversation, right? Yes. I'm really looking forward to it. I think this book's gonna go through the roof. Are you excited about it? I know you're gonna say whatever. No, whatever. it's not whatever. Okay. I have mixed feelings, but I'm willing to do well, it. Well, what's the mixed part? What's the negative part? Well, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. I mean, to make a story juicy, you've got to have a few people in there who are uncomfortable. Well, sometimes you don't tell who it is, and sometimes, yeah. I mean, some people, it's crucial, it would be a good, you know. Well, why are you afraid, man? You're, 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 uh, it's time to, it's, it's time, you've lived enough, it's time to do a memoir. You know, why not get it out there? They'll sell more copies the more real you are, the more real names you put in, the more juice, the more dirt. And the thing is, you're going to see it all transcribed and give your go-ahead before you put it out. It's not like it's going to go out without your... You'll still get the go-ahead, you'll get, still get the, the final say. I'm going to transcribe with Paula, and then you'll get the final say. So I'm just saying, real emotion and real dirt and real names sell. Oh, I know that. And the Pogue story is a good one. And I'm just, oh, I got a lot of those stories like that. I know, but I'm just saying. And it, so this is like a dry run. I think it went pretty well for a dry run. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah.